Hello. Grant, Hi. Kagoon, how are you guys doing? Hi, BDL, how are you? Um, so, I have a question to ask the audience. Would you like to talk to be half an hour with lots of discussion afterwards, or would you like to be bored for a full hour? Half an hour. <laughs> uh, so I, I will wow. admit, I will admit that. Oh, let me turn this on because I have a loud voice, but not probably loud enough, and it probably won't, won't get recorded. Um, yeah, I will admit that the past two talks that were half an hour long engaged me far more than the full hour talks that I've been watching before, and that might have to do with the hour of the day and the amount of attention I can pay to a full hour talk. So, I'm going to go through the slides quickly, talk a little bit about glibc, the problems we're having, and where Linux developers can actually help engage with the community to solve some of these problems. And I think some of the problems are very similar to what you face in the Linux world, in particular uh, with regards to performance benchmarking, micro benchmarks, and whole system benchmarking. Quick question. Yes, go for it. Since I kind of saw a preview of your slide deck. Yeah. Yeah. Can you explain as you go why, whether it's because it's something that's already in place or... or yes, like so that was a comparison of... Yeah. So for the audience, uh, the question is, uh, there's going to be some slides that say no, and uh, Brandon would like me to clarify whether it's no because we didn't get around to it, or it's no because something has blocked us from making progress on that particular issue. So, um, can you see library or that thing between you and your goal? Um, so welcome. This is an overview. We're going to kind of cover three things. Uh, a whirlwind tour of new stuff that came out in glibc, uh, where we need help, and then take questions from the audience. So I want to keep the talk you know, rather simple and quick, and then get to having people ask questions about either related functionality or things that aren't even on this talk that you want to talk about in terms of glibc. Um, so, you know, welcome. Whether you're an application developer or a kernel developer, you often have to think about how your functionality is going to interface with user space. Uh, the library that gets linked into almost every application is a C library. Uh, if you're on Android, you'd be using Bionic. On most Linux systems, enterprise Linux systems, you're going to be using glibc. And uh, we received excellent feedback last year from this audience, and I hope that we get some of that again. Uh, we did listen, so remember your questions, and when we get to the end of the talk, we can, uh, we can talk about them. Um, so, glibc is the library that often receives a lot of complaints, uh, performance, behavior, or missing features, and we kind of like it this way, and I say we kind of like it this way because it really means that people are using the library and paying attention to uh, their performance. What that means from our side is that we need to continue to pay attention to uh, user requirements and to take what is our library's mandate, which is to be a high performance C library, and actually look at the performance aspect of the library. Um, so we need to stay relevant, we need to engage developers, and we need to get developer help to address some of these complaints. Particularly, we're going to give talks like these to talk about the issues the library has. So I'm going to go really fast through some of the new things that have come out in glibc. Uh, we've made it through uh, two time box releases. There are two dedicated developers now. Uh, if you have x86-64 or just generic x86 changes, assembly, low-level things that you want to get into glibc, uh, Andreas Jagger, who's at SUSE, and myself at Red Hat uh, are committed to reviewing those kinds of changes. So we will look at x86 assembly and tell you if it's bad or if it's good, if you want to make changes to low-level functions. Um, and if you are a language person or a language expert and you're porting any stuff to new languages, uh, there are experts on the mailing list now from Sugar Labs who are doing new locales and new languages. So, uh, you know, if you're working with a minority community or you want a new locale, uh, come on list and talk to them and they can help you. Um, we have no effective bug triage process. We have more patches in the community can review and we have less than optimal testing infrastructure. And I'm excited by this because it means we're exactly like every other project. And that means that we're not horribly broken. <laughs> so if you know about the community in the past, sometimes we, uh, you know, we didn't think about these things. And by not thinking about them, uh, we were going to get in trouble. So I'm going to have a short digression here. Um, we want a logo for glibc. At least I want a logo for glibc. So we've had some ideas for a logo. And I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. 
So the, the ideas are a keystone, a pillar, an obese chimera, a tree, a diamond, a GNU in a library, or a bridge troll. So who says keystone would be a good logo? One, okay, pillar. One, not a, an obese chimera. Don't, don't raise your hands for that one. <laughs> All right. Uh, the other bird is a glossy ibis. Uh, if, uh, if you know, it uh, kind of looks like an emu, but with a long, a long nose. H hands up for a glossy ibis. Oh, like that. Uh, a tree. A diamond. ABIs are forever. Okay. Uh, a bridge troll. All right, okay, I think bridge troll is likely to be the one that wins. Um, so the goal here is I think we're going to have uh, an LWN contest for a logo. So uh, if you find yourself uh, with any shred of artistic talent, then uh, uh, keep an eye out for an LWN article about a logo for glibc. Um, so this is our release status. We're actually into active development for 2.18. There are two months left uh, in 2.18 development. So if there is anything that you want to see get into 2.18 that is then eventually going to end up uh, down the line six months or a year from now in a distro, then you have to start thinking about getting that kind of change into glibc uh, right now. Um, a couple of things that are coming up on, on 2.18 development is uh, with Haswell coming out in June, uh, Andy Clean has posted uh, patches for hardware localization in glibc. And we can actually talk about that in detail. Um, there's still a lot to review in these patches and a lot to discuss, but the basic gist of the idea is that um, the pthread functions in the library would have the ability to elide locks. So you use Intel's TSX to uh, avoid taking locks for pthread mutex lock, and that basically begins a transactional memory um, section, and then by the time you get to the unlock, you're hoping that that's a short critical section. It fits in the transactional memory buffer. And at the unlock time, you end the transaction. And hopefully, the CPU commits that all for you, uh, or it aborts. So um, we're looking at adding uh, uh, transactional memory support for all the locks in glibc. Well, a lot of the locks in glibc. Um, we have some library dependency cleanup handling, some math routine cleanups that are coming into 18. We have some IPv4, IPv6 dual stack issues. Uh, for anyone working on networking code in glibc, uh, the resolver has been the source of pain for a lot of people. Uh, function, uh, applications like Mozilla, complex applications doing networking. Uh, the glibc resolver doesn't necessarily follow a lot of the RFCs in the way that it's expected that they should be followed. Um, we need some help in this area, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, at the end of the day, when 2.18 closes, we'll have some 54 key bugs fixed, two CVEs, and, uh, and hopefully uh, have started looking at some of this uh, header cleanup. So with the kernel doing some of, with the kernel having done some UAPI changes to the headers for user space, we're looking at uh, mirroring some of those changes in the way our headers are structured. It helps in some scenarios where user space applications include kernel headers first, then glibc header second. Sometimes you get structure conflicts. If you order them the other way around, you get no structure conflicts. We want some better coordination between those two types of headers. Uh, a good example of uh, headers that conflict is inet in.h, uh, inet in 6.h as well. Uh, so the, the struct uh, IPv6 structures actually conflict. There's definitions in the kernel headers, and there's definitions in glibc headers. So again, two months left. If you have something you want to get into 2.18, start thinking about it now. Get it in. It'll likely show up in a distro in about a year or six months. Uh, new features. Um, last year, we were here for uh, the Linux Foundation Collaboration Summit. Um, the biggest complaint was that we had um, second class architectures. Uh, ARM, MIPS, and a couple of other architectures had been pushed into ports. With the new kind of community and the consensus that we were trying to build there, we realized that it's much easier to actually have everybody be in one tree. We're not going to treat anybody like second class architectures, but people have stepped up to do the work for those architectures, which is nice. So we now have everything in one tree, and we're actually doing changes across all the architectures, generalizing code. Um, so it was a go, and I think it's making it better and easier for people to maintain uh, some non-core ports in the tree. So um, 
There's still more technical work to do there, uh, and we can talk about that later if anyone is interested in uh, kind of non-core architectures that, that, receive, uh, that receive maintenance now because they're in the core ports. It's nice too, you only have to get cloned once. Um, for people in the audience, the minimum kernel supported has been pushed up to 2616 in the 217 glibc release. We do not support any kernel older than that. Um, some people might not care, some people do care, um, but uh, as we roll forward, we need to push the kernel versions up we need to get rid of some of the code that is no longer being used. If you want to use old kernels, we suggest sticking with old glibcs. Um, uh, the the age-old adage is kind of like, if you build kernel X, you should use glibc Y, and you should likely use an older toolchain. And all those three things in the stack have to kind of line up temporally. If you use too new a compiler with too old a kernel, you're going to have problems. If you use too new a glibc with too old a kernel, you're going to have problems, right? So line all those three things up, and you will get a high probability of your system being functioning. Uh, improved cross-support. If there's anybody doing cross-compilation, uh, we actually now have bootstrap support where you are not required to have a previously built C library to build the current C library. Um, it's nice for embedded builds. Um, we have a new micro-benchmark suite in the... Uh, in the glibc right now. Uh, the reason we have it is because we had been getting performance-related patches, and we did not know how to accept those kinds of patches. We had no criteria for accepting performance-related patches. So one of the steps we've taken in the 2.18 release is to add a micro-benchmark suite. Um, a micro-benchmark suite is not the be-all and end-all of the way we're going to accept performance-related patches. Uh, it still requires that a human look at the patches, analyze them, and make a judgment call. But the micro-benchmark suite hopefully provides a data point uh, and allows perhaps other targets to run the same micro-benchmark to look at how those numbers relatively impact their architecture. Um, right now, the micro-benchmark suite is heavily being used for libm uh, performance-related changes. Uh, libm is kind of easy to put into a micro-benchmark because there are univariate, and at most, you know, the multivariate functions there have two input arguments, and it's kind of easy to feed them through, uh, through a, a micro-benchmark framework. Um, math library stuff, new locales. Um, for anyone doing ARM development, uh, pay attention to this. The ARM hard float um, has changed the dynamic loader name, okay? What that means is that if you have an old root file system, you are going to need to link to uh, the new dynamic loader name if you have old libraries built with the old linker name. Uh, as of 2.16, the fixes are in for supporting the alternate uh, name for the loader. Uh, there were a couple of binutils bugs that means uh, you may need to backport some 2.18 patches only if you run in a mixed hybrid environment where you have soft float and hard float binaries running in the same root file system. So most people tend for ARM to use an entire hard float root file system or an entire soft float root file system. Mostly it depends on, hey, did my SOC vendor, or does, does this SOC have a Neon on it or a VFP, or, does my, or is this an ARM, v, an ARM 7 or an ARM 9 system that has no FPU and we're doing all soft float? Um, there is some new machine support, so um, we're looking at Xilinx Micro Microblaze for 2.18, that's in review. Um, we don't know, again, if it's going to get into 2.18, depends on how many people we can get to help review the new ports. New ports are usually a lot of work. Um, we have ARCH64 support as of 2.17, so if you have ARCH64 hardware, you can clone 2.17 and you can start using that as the base for doing development, for optimizations for anything that you need to get in there for ARCH64. Uh, Tylera is a, a multi-core system um, called TileGX and Tile Pro was added in 2.16. And as of 2.16, we also had the X32 hybrid ABI. So that's uh, running on x86-64 code, but doing uh, pointers and a couple of other things only with 32 bits. And the the claim there is that you get a performance benefit for doing that because most apps don't actually need all 64 bits. Um, I remember a long time ago reading an HPUX 
a how-to article, white paper, about a very similar situation because other OSs have already done this transition where you go from 32-bit to 64-bit, and the question is, why isn't my app twice as fast in 64-bit? Well, there's a lot of reasons why it's not twice as fast. And in fact, a lot of apps don't need the, the full 64-bit pointer support. Um, so the only thing I'm going to say quickly about this slide is, uh, if you have a new machine or you're working on any bring up for new hardware, come talk to us soon. The last two releases we've had to delay for a month when someone large came and said, oh, I'm sorry, can you please halt the release because I want ARC64 in. Oh, I'm sorry, can you please halt the release because I want uh, this ABI added. We have done so. We have pushed the release back. But what we'd really like to see is early engagement from kernel developers and vendors who are adding uh, support for architectures or ports to come work with us um, and it, or at least notify us that if you can't tell us what you're going to do, come talk to us and say, we're going to be releasing something secret in a couple of months, but, you know, uh, give us time to, uh, to fix things. Um, comparison with short-term goals from last year. So I'm posting, these were goals that we had last year as a community, and I've come back this year, and I'm kind of writing up whether or not we hit some of these goals and, uh, and listing ones that we didn't come up with. So... The ones that are a no means that we did not have anyone from the community step up to assist uh, glibc in handling these issues. There were no blockers that prevented us from making progress on the two no issues. We just, no one stepped up to do it. Um, a bug triage process is not something that's very interesting to most developers, uh, but we need an effective way to handle some of the critical CVEs that come in for glibc, and we don't even have much of a process for that. Um, CVEs generally get handled by upstream distros, and they may eventually make it back to glibc. We would really like for uh, the work to be more proactive in those kinds of bug fixes and triage and making it into mainline and then backports to stable releases. Um, one of the things that we've kind of talked about recently in this bug triage process is, hey, what if all the distros actually did work in Git branches, and then we began to make the visibility of this a little bit a little bit better at the, at the upstream level. So if, you know, uh, you know, Fedora had a Git branch upstream and, you know, Canonical had one, and then we could cherry pick from various branches back to mainstream and then back to stable branches, it would be really nice to be able to do that. We don't have that today. Um, TIRPC, uh, people are not familiar with this, this is a transport independent RPC layer which handles NFS v4 uh, and IPv4 and IPv6 dual stack. Whereas the current glibc uh, Sun RPC implementation handles only IPv4. Um, and what really needs to happen there is someone with an interest in networking and an interest in RPC needs to help us do the transition between glibc's Sun RPC and the uh, bull TIRPC implementation. Brandon, you had a question? Uh, well, you might have just started to address it. Yeah. When I've seen TIRPC in my work, it's from Sun and it's got an obnoxious license. So is there an alternative implementation? Um, so, so the, uh, the bull uh, has an implementation for TIRPC, and I thought that was the only one. I had no idea. Sorry, another question in the back. Uh, let, me, uh, let me restate. So Brandon has asked, when I see TIRPC, it is from Sun and it has a terrible license. And I didn't even know there was one from Sun. So. I mean, it's, it's technically open source, but yeah. it's GPL I do not think, yeah, I do not think that's the case for the TIRPC that Bull has implemented. So, question? Well, so, uh, response actually to the, the TIRPC question. Um, <clears throat> your, your employer uh, does actually have a GPL version of TIRPC that is used in both Fedora and Red Hat yes. at this point. Um, and that was relicensed by Sun explicitly for use by, uh, <clears throat> with Linux. Okay. Brilliant. So, I mean, um, I guess then the only thing that really, uh, the discussion that we haven't had with, with other people has been uh, cooperation with TIP, TIRPC in terms of how do we actually hand off whether or not these headers are still compatible and you can rebuild old apps and make sure apps don't crash. Uh, question over there, yes. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm from the NFS Ganesha uh, NFS server project. Awesome. And uh, we have been working on an enhanced TIRPC uh, okay. that, and we've been talking with Red Hat about it. Um, 
being a direct replacement for the Sun ABI um, is probably uh, going to be a no-go because the ABI's got so many problems, uh, particularly for what we needed, which was um, a full duplex RPC f to support the new protocols that um, we really it, it's looking hard to be backward compatible, so it may be a separate one uh, still to be determined. But this is a new stack that's out there, and it's act, we're out on GitHub, and it's part of the core of Ganesha itself right now. But we would like to split it off as a separate package so that other people can use it as well. That would be excellent. And again, the, the, the thing that worries a conservative project like glibc is to continue to allow applications that were written by users to work regardless of the, you know, the transition. We would like to not have the Sun RPC implementation in glibc because it, it's kind of a, it's a piece that doesn't necessarily match what the library's goals are. Um, so I think we should talk about what the progress is that we want to make there. Yeah, that's, that's some of the issues there. We have had uh, clashes where the built-in TIRPC uh, just insists on, on playing around in our sandbox. And uh, yeah, if we split them out where they were separate and we could leave it uh, a classic or legacy or I don't know how the hell to fix it, TIRPC for people who don't want to move from that API but have something separate but packageable so that uh, new folks and new apps can use it. Yeah, that'd be and cool. Absolutely agree. I mean, uh, some of the transitional issues there are likely we enable uh, uh, warnings when you include the old headers, and then you switch to uh, warnings when you link with, you know, the library. If we split it off into a separate library, the we really wish we'd we'd gotten to this TIRPC issue earlier because, for example, like so we've got this microblaze port coming into 2.18. If that port lands and TIRPC is still in glibc, the symbols, the ABI symbol set for Microblaze will include all the symbols for the Sun RPC, which means we can never remove it from there after. Right? So if we can solve this issue in the next two months, unfortunately I don't think it's going to happen, but we could, we could get a new port in without this set of Sun RPC symbols and we wouldn't have to maintain backwards compatibility for at least one target. So. Uh, I appreciate that. I, I will have to get your name. Please come talk to me after the talk so that we can coordinate and at least talk about some of this stuff. Um, <laughs> say, say again. <laughs> I'm willing to do some work. So, uh, uh, you know, I, we want to get the Sun RPC stuff kind of cleaned up and split into a separate library. Uh, merging with eglibc and glibc, I've already talked about there's been some progress done there. Uh, testing. Uh, some progress in that we've got a micro benchmark and performance criteria for looking at how patches affect that. Uh, documentation, some. We actually now, for the first time ever, have a POSIX threads chapter in the C library manual. Uh, we didn't previously have it. The only canonical source was the man pages previously, which Michael Karras does a wonderful job of maintaining. Um, but we've just started documenting uh, how glibc, all of glibc's kind of p thread functions, and we need, we need, we've done some work there, so we need some help. Uh, we've also started documenting what every other OS has already done, which is to have a little table at the bottom of every function to say, is it MT thread safe? Is it async signal safe? Yes or no? Is it POSIX compliant? Yes or no? You know, if you've looked at any Solaris, HPUX manuals, there's a, little <laughs> there's a little table at the bottom. So we are hoping to have that table such that if you ever are designing something, talking to a developer, and they say, is this function asynchronous signal safe? You say, pull up the manual, look at the little table at the bottom of the function, if it says yes, then it is. If it says no, it isn't. Um, so to go a long way to helping people uh, uh, design with those APIs. Um, Long-term goals. Uh, we've had two sums here. And this is kind of nice, because I didn't think we'd get to any of these things. Um, uh, for the auto-generated libm, I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, we're actually working with a team of researchers in, in Paris. Um, and I'll mention who they are. Um, and trace, we've got some. We begin to integrate system tap. So the system tap traces have gone into the dynamic loader, uh, memory allocation routines. We have patches for those, patches for threading, and math library slow paths. Um, if people have any suggestions for how, how else we could get trace into the C library, and particularly for threading, I am more than open to suggestions. 
the current progress that we're making is with system tap because of the ability it allows to have um, tap points within the library that are effectively zero cost. Uh, but when you turn on those taps, you can get data for a very specific set of things that you want to know about. People like this a lot better than Ptrace. Ptrace API pauses all of the threads in a particular process. That's not what people want. We actually want to get to the point where the system tap traces are per syscall. So that rather than using ptrace, you just say, I want to see the right syscalls, and I want to see all the arguments to the right syscall and just the right syscall for just this thread, right, or just this process. Um, and using system tap would give you some of that flexibility, whereas using ptrace actually halts you at every entry to the syscall path in the kernel, which is not what some people want in terms of trace. Um, no power awareness and no exceptionless syscalls. Uh, exceptionless syscalls are, are actually what's considered a research topic. They're asynchronous syscalls. It's like if you did a write on the user space side, the write actually just queues data and it's asynchronous and the user space would then go off and do something else and then maybe come back when the write completes. Um, we won't talk about that. Where do we need help? Um, six places. I'm going to talk about likely only two of them. How am I doing for time? Am I? Hmm? Oh, okay. Um, well, I wanted to make this talk 30 minutes. So, um, math libraries. We're only going to talk about two of these math library and performance. Math library. Um, people come to us and say there are several things wrong with your math library, but predominantly people are in one of three categories. Your math library is imprecise, right? Your math, I don't care about the math library, or the math library is too slow. Um, which leads us to think that we should really possibly have three variants of the math library, one that's high precision, one that's for the people that don't care, and one that's with constant runtime. And by constant runtime, you're going to have to accept that some of your functions will not be accurate, may not follow IEEE uh, standards, may not raise certain exceptions in certain corner cases because they are imprecise. Um, the problem that we have when we look at these three things is that um, the default is likely going to be remaining as the IBM multi-precision code that we currently have in glibc. It is quite good, and the fallback path for when you need high precision is to use uh, multi-precision integer code or multi-precision floating point code to compute the number of bits that you need to get the right answer. The alternative that we have is to actually auto-generate all of the math functions. And we auto-generate them based on the definition of the function, we use a couple of mathematical techniques to generate some polynomials that approximate the math functions. We generate C code from that, and we compile it into the library variants. If you want high precision, you crank up the number of bits in the generated polynomial. If you want low precision, you crank down the number of bits in generated polynomial. You build out two versions of those C libraries, one with high number of bits, one with low number of bits. And you likely select them via compiler flag, which chooses a different symbol alias. So under the hood, you'll likely have three different functions, three different implementations. Um, is it going to remain as one math library? Probably unlikely, because uh, if it did, you would have three times as much space taken up by libm in your, in your VM space. So what we probably want is to split it into libm1, libm2, libm3. You won't see the difference. Uh, it'll just be dash lm, and then those two flags maybe select between one or the other as a rewrite rule for the compiler driver. Some things under the hood will still have to be there, like a libm.so will still have to symlink to the default libm for your system. Um, but uh, this is one of the areas, you know, future looking, long term, where uh, there's the possibility to be able to do this and do it easily and quickly for new architectures, new hardware, uh, SOCs. For example, so um, Solia, which is the, the solver that generates the, uh, the Ramirez polynomials, um, you know, because it generates C code, you can target it at whatever your compiler can target. If it's a GPU, or if it's OpenCL, or if it's a different API, you can actually generate a libm variant that might be able to do offload onto a GPU, um, and then provide that variant, and then use the same mechanisms to select the alternate implementation. Um, so the areas where we want some help wanted here is um, micro benchmark coverage for the math library is going to be incredibly useful. Uh, the more functions we cover with the microbenchmark, the more we'll be able to validate any new functions that we build that are auto-generated. 
The problem with the auto-generated functions is that they don't have the millions of hours that the IBM multi-precision code has in production use today. Um, so we need to build out infrastructure for selecting alternate implementations as well. If you are a math geek and you like looking at this stuff, there are lots of things to do in, in LibM. Um, in fact, I think recently we found out that uh, you know, LibM's ULP implementation for looking at relative error of, a, of an output was completely incorrect, mathematically imprecise. So uh, we are always looking for people that are interested in LibM. Um, and Brandon, you have a question. Um, do you have a microphone? Um, you mentioned possibly cast, having three math libraries and a compile time selecting one, yep. and each of those would resolve to a different name. Now, of course, you could rewrite the symbol names in an object file, but are there any other barriers apart from the symbol names from being able to run time select your math library, and is there a demand for that? Um, so I know of no demand for it, okay. particularly because of the following problem. How do you handle the runtime selection? And in fact, we can talk about runtime tunables because it's actually a problem. Um, lib A requires a high precision math library. Lib B requires a constant runtime libra math library. Okay. What do you do in those cases, yep. right? Lib A calls a function in some other library that requires high precision. You can't make the choice per process. The choice is actually made per context. Mm -hmm. And by context, I mean either a critical section or right. some block of code. So Runtime tunables is a very interesting discussion that we can have, but um, it is kind of an unsolved problem for glibc, but it is a problem, and we do acknowledge that not all of our internal tunables are correctly tuned to your workloads. Right. Right? And in fact, we have internal tunables that are tuned to arbitrary workloads that we never documented, so we don't know what the answer is. Right. So to give you an example, uh, in the in the MPTL and the pthread library, we cache stacks from threads so that when we create a thread, we look at the stack cache. We say, do we have a stack that matches the size of the stack that we need? Yes, we do. We use the cache. That cache's maximum size is 40 megabytes. Why? Hmm. We don't know. Yeah. Right? We just, we honestly, we, I think uh, there's no historical evidence of why that cache should be 40 megs. We never tuned it. It's not an external tunable. Um, some people have complained about it, and I think some people actually just go in and hack the uh, source RPM, change the tunable to something larger, rebuild the C library, and stuff it back in. Uh, that's an incredibly dangerous thing to do because you just built a library that you didn't validate, and you're running it on a production system or a test system. So um, I wouldn't recommend it, but what I would recommend is that you, you come talk to us about, um, about runtime tunables. So I'll, I'll get to that uh, in a second. Um, so, performance and benchmarking. Um, what glibc really wants to get to, what we hope to get to at some point, is to go from micro benchmarks to whole system benchmarks. At the whole system benchmark phase, we want to be able to give users the ability to run the whole system benchmarks, gather data for all the libc functions, and say, here's the data that represents my workload. You know, hand it to the developers and say, um, can we look at that? Can we hold that data? When we do another release, can we compare how we did against the collected data to then go back to the user and say, hey, you know, we've really regressed on the workloads that you've submitted. Um, are you interested in helping out in these cases? Uh, we want to engage the users in being involved in what your workloads are, what their performance characteristics are, and how they relate to, to glibc. So that if we make changes, we know which one of these things are going to impact us. Um, Right now, as I said today, we only have the start of micro-benchmarking in glibc. Um, we're going to need to move further than that because, as people have already stated on LIST, Richard Earnshaw from ARM said to us recently, listen, whole system benchmarking has to be done for ARM because you have to have power considerations for the whole SOC. You need to run your entire workload. You need to look at how your glibc change is likely going to impact um, the, the power constraints. So the classic example is as follows. You're on an ARM hardware with neon. If you don't turn the neon unit on, kernel context switches for processes don't have to save and restore the neon registers. Okay? That's excellent. 
However, now if you go into glibc and you're naive and you say, well, I want to optimize memset to use neon hardware registers, you've now just forced neon to be on for all processes, which means that the kernel on context switch now needs to do an additional save and restore for all the neon registers, right? So it's those kinds of things where if you have an optimization in glibc, you might not have thought of the conscious decision to do that has power implications for the rest of the system. Um, so I've talked about whole system benchmarking here. And so, again, our, our help wanted here is um, we will likely reach out to people in the kernel community regarding uh, whole system benchmarking and, uh, and benchmarking as a whole to attempt to get an idea of like, what are, what's best practice, what are people doing currently, and how can we apply that to, uh, to user space and to glibc in particular. Um, I'm looking at ideas for how to collect the data and analyze it. Where do you store it? Where do you store lots of data from users in, in large workloads? Um, Brandon, this relates to your question, runtime tunables. Uh, there's a lot of help wanted here in that the default in the library will never match all of your workloads. We're going to have average case workloads. Our defaults should be tuned to those average case workloads. Um, one of the interesting things that happens if you provide live tuning of the tunables which is what you were saying, why can't you tune some of these things live? I think you can tune some things live. The pthread default stack size is an excellent example of a tunable that can be tuned live. What's the nice thing about that? The nice thing about that is that you spawn your workload, you attach to a couple of key processes, and using the API for changing these tunables live, you can write an adaptive algorithm to change the tunables and look at the impulse response in your behavior based on the tunable. right? At one point, you're going to say, OK, this is a, I think it's a pretty good algorithm for changing this tunable in the runtime library. And then we can actually take that algorithm and suggest it as an automatic tunable in glibc that would be enabled by default if you wanted it. Right? That way, the default now becomes this auto-tuning algorithm. And you still have the live tuning API to allow you to change it if the algorithm is pathological in your workload or something else. Um, so again, uh, if people are interested in live tuning of systems for uh, runtime performance, we need someone to look at this and look into the defaults that were chosen in the C library, why they were chosen, and, and making better choices there. Uh, I'm going to skip this one, but if you're interested in networking, uh, you can come talk to me. Um, the dual stack implementation issues we have in glibc are that the resolver doesn't follow the RFCs as written. Uh, that or our interpretation of the RFCs was incorrect. Uh, but we do have a lot of bugs filed against the glibc resolver in terms of behavior and performance. And uh, locales, again, language experts, anyone who wants to get involved. Uh, we're looking for people who are interested in uh, new languages. And we need to strengthen ties with uh, stakeholders in GNOME and KDE because uh, the locales for glibc are still used. Um, although some projects are already using libicu or libicu for C, which uses uh, the uh, common locale data repository, which is another repository of locale information. Uh, and documentation, and that's it. So, questions? Could you say more about the resolver issues? It's just so ugly we don't want to look at it. Um, so I don't really want to say more about the resolver issues because they're rather complex. Um, I would have to go back to my notes to look at them. Um, most of them have to do with RFC interpretations, like um, what's the one? Um, AF adder config, right? If you have an IPv4 interface up and you have an IPv6 interface up, what's the resolver? What should the resolver be doing with both those interfaces up? if you try to resolve against the loop, uh, loop back. Um, you know, there are, I think, probably about five cases. And if I have, um, um, here. I'll pull up this just quickly. So this is the Fedora project here, the Fedora uh, request for enhancement for these things. And these are the, can people still read those? Here. 
These are the get adder info issues that we've identified in the resolver. So um, uh, returns uh, duplicate wrong addresses, but I think the ones that are most important for me are the AI adder config issues in terms of failing to resolve certain addresses or even sending unwanted IPv6 queries if your IPv6 interfaces aren't even up. Um, so it is difficult code to work with because the code is written to follow the RFCs and that results in rather ugly looking code in terms of the logic that the code uses to follow the RFC. I don't know what to do in this case. We almost have to rewrite the resolver and then step by step in the resolver kind of document how, what part of the RFC it was trying to adhere to for that piece of code. Um, however, doing that means we're not bug for bug compatible in some cases, and that the changes are going to be so serious that applications are going to fail to work because they expected the previous resolver's results. I, it's not clear what to do here. I think our, our first step is to look at the RFCs and make baby steps against the current resolver to ensure we solve real bugs reported by real users for real applications. So one of the things Ulrich Drecker was good at was saying no, because he didn't want to include garbage into the glibc and maintaining it. Um, good. So you're still doing that. That's good. Uh, the question is, what I'm having is, so beyond that, is there any chance you could split up some of the stuff? Is there any, w I mean, it sounds to me like the ABI, once it's part of glibc and it links with the standard thing that you cannot split into a separate library, even if you could get the compilers to automatically include these additional libraries. Um, so you're saying taking the library and split it into more pieces? Yeah, so it's easier to maintain. Like you have libm is separate and you could do similar things with the networking code. Um, I think the answer is yes. We could probably split the, the library into more pieces. And this is kind of the issue with TIRPC and SunRPC is that if it had been a separate library, it would have been a different issue. And you know, um, However, as Roland pointed out to me, if today I went and did all the work required for TIRPC, I would have gotten nowhere because I would still be maintaining you know, the, the code for the transition and I would still be working on that. We need, I think, additional resources in the community who are interested in these kinds of things, like people doing uh, additional TIRPC work, to coordinate with us and, and look at those ABIs and transition to a split library. Yeah. I'd like to I'd see. The reason that the resolver is in here is historical, and also the resolver ties into the name server caching daemon, right? And so the name server caching daemon also being part of glibc means that um, when that, the make files currently build all of that code plus the resolver, and then they build kind of two different versions of it such that when you call the resolver, it routes your request to the name server caching daemon rather than actually running the, the real resolver code when, when, once the daemon's up, right? And so that kind of linkage I guess if we cut the library at that point, someone else also has to take care of uh, NSCD, right? So, and, and some people do not like NSCD. Despite that, there are actually still a lot of users using NSCD to cache requests. Uh, but one question. Um, for the TNIPC 2.17, it supports the ARM 64 bits. Is backward compatible with the 32 bits ARM? Um, it's a different architecture completely. So ARCH64 is a different ISA, and it is an ARM V8A port for ARCH for ARCH64. So it it is not not in any way going to support 32-bit ARCH. Sorry, 32-bit ARM. Their both targets are currently in glibc. You're either going to compile for 32-bit ARM, and that's going to be ARM v7, ARM v6. You know. Uh, Thumb, no thumb variants, and then you have also the option to target uh, ARM V8A, which is the ARCH64 port that is in 217. Yeah, uh, actually, in some product, you know, you have the several CPUs. Some of them is ARM V7, some of, some of them is ARM V8, but uh, it's uh, just just generate one executable. Uh, I don't know any any solution on that. Um, that's a good question, and. I don't know that there's anyone working on that. I'm not aware of it. John Masters at the back of the room is nodding his head no. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, so I mean, it's kind of the same kind of problem that uh, IBM had with Cell and the PowerPC and the SPUs in that 
you can take an ELF file, you can glob kind of two ELFs together, and you've got the code that's been compiled for the SPU, and you've got the code that's compiled for the power portion. And when you run that, the kernel knows this part goes to the SPU, this part gets executed and mapped in as a PowerPC executable. Um, has anyone done that for ARC64 and 32-bit ARM? No, not that I'm aware of. So, but if you're interested. Yeah. Any other questions? Benchmarking? Is anyone doing benchmarking? How are you collecting your data? Where are you storing it? How are you doing analysis? Are there other benchmarks that we could run that are free that don't require licenses or force me not to talk about the results? Okay, thank you very much.